Hello, boys and girls. Um, the chaos should be over. Back to a uh, meeting today and then Thursday and then Tuesday and then Thursday. And just like the dreary, uh, like our dreary old routine, which is good. I like routines. Um, but today, I'm gonna, I hope you found the short video and the introduction on Nozick online. Um, and you've had some time to look at it. I um, thought I posted over the weekend, but well, something, I don't know. I didn't. So here I outline uh, the basic beginning of that. I'll recap it real fast in case you haven't seen it. Um, Nozick's theory is a very different theory from Rawls. He writes his theory in some ways as a response to Rawls, or a contrast to Rawls. And so today we're going to just discuss his own theory and the arguments he gives for it. And then the next two classes, we're going to compare two theories, in particular looking at his, his criticism of Rawls. So try and figure out which, uh, which of the two might be better, or what parts of the two might be attractive. So what Nozick does, he starts out, he says there's two ways you can think about justice, an end state theory and historical theories. Um, end state theories are theories that look at just sort of the outcome distributions. So we're talking about economic or social or distributive justice. End state theories tell you a distribution in holdings of possessions, property, wealth, income, whatever, right? It's just if it fits a certain pattern. That's a, not the only type of end state theory you could imagine, but that's the most prominent one. Simply, you know, think of the simplest form. Distribution is just if everyone has an equal amount of whatever the relevant good is. Primary goods for Rawls, income maybe more commonly, or wealth if you want, right? That's an end state theory. It says here's a pattern, an overall whole set of holdings that needs to obtain for justice to be served. He says that's one way to look at it. What we do then is we just look at, in the simplest form, we look at a time slice, he calls it the time slice view. We just cut, you know, slice of time, say today at uh, whatever it's, 2 or uh, 2 4 p.m., right? What's, the, what's the, di the distribution of holdings? If it fits some desired pattern, equal, where in Rawls's case, the least will have the most they could possibly. Right. And he say, wants to contrast that with a different view, which is a historical view. He says, well, if you have this end state view, right, then what matters really is just, is the overall pattern of holdings correct, right? It's like, and you don't really matter, like, it doesn't really matter how you get there. You could get there in a variety of ways. The government could distribute it that way. It could, like, by accident happen that way. I could distribute, as long as the overall set of, you know, the overall... Uh, set of holdings is correct, correctly distri distributed, just. Historical theories, by contrast, are very different. They don't look at the, at the pattern of the of holdings, but they look at justice as something that we have to you know, look to yesterday and the day before in history. So on that view, a set of holdings is just, here's, here's the quote, right? A distribution is just if, so sufficient condition, right? whenever it arises from another just distribution by legitimate means. So, given the online lecture, I give the following example. Like, I, hold my, I own my house. Do I? Right? Well, I hold it, right? But do I really own it in the moral sense? Am I justified? Or should it be taken from me and redistributed? On the pattern theory, you say, well, then we have to look at the whole society and look like if there are people who, are, who, are, you know, who need to have more, and then do I have too much to fit the pattern? And then you start rejiggling re it. But not on the historical view. On the historical view, we ask, OK, uh, well, what happened for me to hold the house? Well, I bought it from someone, right? So OK, that's pretty good. Uh, Nozick thinks that's a legitimate means of acquisition. So I bought it from someone. Um, but what about that person, right? Was this a thief? Was I buying stolen goods? If so, then there's an injustice, and we have to rectify the injustice, right? But maybe, no, that person actually owned it too. How come that person owned it? Well, that person bought it from someone, right? Okay, well, how did that person? So we're going back, right? So this is like now 9083 or something, right? Like uh, that person, well, that person actually bu built it, right? Okay, well, what did they use to build it, right? A bunch of wood, nails, hammers, shingles, <laughs> you know, insulating material, a whole bunch of stuff that you need to get. Well, how did they get that? Well, they went to various shops and sawmills and so on, right? Okay, well, how did they own their things? Well, well they bought it from people. Did they own it? And so you have to 
it's really complicated, like really fine tentacles through his, you know, span backwards through history. But if we can trace all of those back, and there are all these lines, these historical lines of, of ownership are impeccable, all the way up to day one, where at one point, well, where did the wood come from? Well, there was a tree, and someone cut it down. Right? Like, and the, whose tree was it? No one's tree. OK, well, maybe now that the first person who cut it down came to own the tree. So there you have it. And then the whole chain starts. If the whole chain is without blemish, then I actually own my house. That's the historical theory in a nutshell. And so if you have that historical theory, that's like, like Nozick's. Really, it only consists of two, maybe like three principles. It's really two. The third is a, is a fix. But anyway, well, not a fix like a cheating, but it's a fix of what could go wrong. So first, you need a principle of just original acquisition. So you, like all, when we get all the way back to the first day when there was no ownership at all, the tree was owned by no one, someone cut it down, we're assuming that thereby they become to own it, right? We need some type of principle that tells us when we can go from a situation in which there is no ownership to a situation in which there is. We'll look later in term at Locke's theory. Locke is the most famous, and it's not, not a great theory, but it's the best we have. It's, Locke says you mix your labor with it. Something that's unowned, that's what makes you the, own, the first owner. All right, that's a principle of just original acquisition. Now we have a principle about how property comes to be into the world at all. And then the second principle, just transfer, is like how do we go from that first owner to all the subsequent owners in these long chains, all the way up to me today. And so you have things like gift, you have things like sale, you have things like bequest, possibly, and so on. So those are your two principles. That explains how I could become the owner, legitimate owner of my house. Often, of course, these things are not represented, right? And when we go to my house, I can pretty much guarantee that at some point in one of these chains, there's going to be some, there's going to be some mess, messiness going on, right? Some blood being shed, some thievery going on. Um, something went wrong, like the history is, of our world is a pretty nasty one, so something went wrong, I'm pretty sure, right? Um, so crap, right, the whole thing tumbles down, well, no success, so we need a third principle to fix those, those mistakes. It's not so, one possible way to rectify the violation, like say that you steal some wood of mine, well, one obvious way to do it is that you return the wood, right, to me. That's a principle of rectification. Of course, that's the easy case. There are much more difficult cases. Um, the Nazis steal some Jewish family's art, return it to the family. Uh-oh, family's dead, right? And now what? Well, really hard, right? It's really complicated. Right? So all that goes into your principle of rectification. Nozick says almost nothing about this. He says, we need it. I don't have a good story. <coughs> he hints what, what the story might look like. He says a little bit about this, but most of it is about just transfer principle. So that's what we'll be looking at. So far? Uh, so number one is like no ownership to ownership by the um, It could be anything, right? For, so the, this is sort of the most general outline of what an entitlement theory will look like. You could have a variety of principles of original acquisition that could fit within an entitlement theory. So John Locke thought it was working. So if you have something that's unowned, and you work on it, then you come, the, you come to be the owner. But that's not the only theory. Um, going way back, Seneca thought that it was occupation. So if you sort of physically occupied a space that was unowned, thereby you could become, like the seats in a theater. This was his, uh, his, uh. Yeah, but notice, right, it has to be previously unowned, right? So if, if somebody already owns it, then you're just an invader, right? <laughs> But if you can really find a piece of that, so Locke, Locke's theory was used in the times of the Americas here in the, to justify the colonization, because people claimed, well, and now the settlers are coming and they're working on the land and they're therefore acquiring it. Of course, this is not exactly correct, like they were self-servingly using the theory, right? They were saying, mm -hmm. well, that's the, of course, these are natives, but you know, they don't really use it. So that makes sense. So, but that's, if that's, the, in practice, it was abused, that's at least the theory, right? If no one was really using it, then you could come in and work on the land and they'll acquire it. Of course, that wasn't what really happened, and so then we need to ask Nozick, well, what then what? It was a violation, right? Because these people were dispossessed, blown off the land. So now they need to be rectified. 
well, now we have a version of that that's in Jewish space, right? Like, okay, well, then those people are dead, long, dead, long gone. Some of them have descendants living among us. Do we just give it back to them? Well, maybe. Um, not everyone thinks that that would be the right way to go about it. But when you say why, there would be no degree of security. There would be no what? Right? No degree, there would be a reconciliation. No, there would be. There would be. If, yeah. Locke has a particular proposal for what one would look like. Um, but if that is violated, so if people try and acquire different things differently, or if they, if you acquire something by working on it, and then I come along and I steal it, um, you remember Locke thinks that it, there's a natural executive right, so you can punish me for that. That's a version of this, right? Do you yeah. not work on the same thing? Um, if you already own it, then I need to get your permission. It's a good question, though, what you're asking, because we'll see la later that one of the worries that people have about Locke's theory is um, if working is good enough to go from zero to one owner, why is it working not also good enough to go from one owner to two owners? Um, it's not, that's not obvious why. That, that seems very natural, the implication. Right? But Locke, the Locke's theory is committed to saying, no, no, zero to one, yes, and then one to two to three, no. Right? So we need an answer. So under Noah's idea of would it be uh, would it be permissible for reparations, like specifically in the case mm -hmm. where the descendants of the original wrong are asked to give reparations to descendants of the people who were wrong, a uh, very prominent example, African Americans who still face some sort of discrimination in society but are no longer in slavery, uh, the general public tends to be Anglo Americans, people who whose ancestors perpetuated the wrong and, and some would argue still perpetuate some types of wrongs through having certain privileges in society by being white Americans. Would Nozick say under the third principle that there's some sort of rectification for the violations that took place long ago and the ones that take place now but just aren't to the same level as the ones that took place long ago? Um, well, there's several, several questions there. One is, did violations happen in the past according to Nozick's theory? Clearly yes. yes. Um, when violations happen, they need to be rectified. So clearly yes. Would, re would reparations be one possibility? Yeah, it would be a very good, would be a very good proposal. It would fit very nicely within Nozick's because you're trying to sort of rectify the, the, the wrongs by returning to people what they were lost. Right. Now, not everyone thinks it's not, it's not obvious that this is the best way, right. but it's a, it's a clear, it's a good first step, right? It's not obvious because it's not that we're dealing not with the same people anymore. And even if those people hadn't been disappropriated like centuries ago, so things would have happened in between. So it's not clear that people now are worse off than they would have been. Otherwise, like mm -hmm. some people, maybe many, but not everyone, right? right? Some people might have a gambling, like a gambling grandfather who threw away something. We don't know. So some people say, "Oh, this, you know, there's tricky, tricky stuff going on there." But most. Most Nozickians think reparations is, a, is an obvious case of rectification. Um, I don't think Nozick would accept that things that are going on right now are as bad as the things that were going on back then. He would, I'm pretty sure, accept that they were, that injustices are still going on. Um, there's a footnote, by the way, in the book where he cites a contemporary of his, a book on black reparations. So he's clearly sympathetic to that. Um, but you know, for things to be bad today, they don't have to be as bad as full-on full slavery. He thinks that's pretty much the worst it can be. So, um, yeah. All right. Did I, did I? Okay. So that's the theory, right? Super simple in a way. We went through all the contortions with Rawls, difference principle, maximin, original positions, veil of ignorance. You don't need all that. This is this is it, right? How are distributions just well, you know? You're the owner if you bought it from someone who was the owner before you, who bought it from someone who was the owner before you, who bought it from, bought it from, bought it from, the very first owner, right? Done. That's your theory. And so he says, you know, it's a rise of, it doesn't mention, oh, no mention whatsoever, there is a mention of distribution, but it, he doesn't mention distribution as a, as a condition, right? There's no pattern or there's no overall, the distribution that results doesn't have to have any characteristics of its own to count as just. So in principle, any distribution could qualify as just as long as it came about the right way. It could be perfectly equal 
by accident it turned out that original people acquire stuff, they trade, fast forward 100, 200, 300 years, hey, everyone has the same amount, fine, right? Hey, 10% own 90%, fine. Hey, anything in between, fine. Right? Doesn't matter, as long as the process is correct. That's very different from these end state or pattern theories, right? Okay. All right, we said clear so far? That's it, right? <laughs> There's no catch. There's, that's it, you know the theory now. Um, Nozick thinks, one, in the video I, uh, we dis I discussed this, thinks one of the nice, the nice features of this theory is in his view, at least, he thinks this is a very plausible idea, right? Intuitively, if we think, if somebody, if we ask ourselves, you know, am I the rightful owner of my car, the first answer you'd, say, you'd give is, well, yeah, because I didn't steal it, right? So that's really intuitive, right? And he thinks, well, that's just, well, if that's a really intuitive story, then any good theory of justice must be able to accommodate that story. And he thinks pattern theories or end state theories cannot, fundamentally cannot accommodate that story because they only look at the outcome distribution, and it doesn't, the outcome distribution can be any old way. Difference principles satisfied, right? The least will off have the most they can expect to have. That's the story. There's no, like, can get the most they expect to satisfy through exchange, right? That's not the story. The story is the most they can expect to, expect to get. That's what the, so he thinks this stuff just drops out of the picture, and it's a real big problem. Most of the argument that Nozick gives in the book um, is actually not a defense of any of this. Right? Things is pretty straightforward. You know what I mean about rectification, so reparations is an example. You know what I mean by just transfer, gift, exchange, bequest, maybe other things. Um, and we kind of have an idea of just original acquisition, although he does a little bit of a, yeah, we'll figure that out someday. Right? <laughs> it turns out pretty difficult, but we'll figure it out someday. The rest, of the, the rest of the whole section, like the second part of the book, is him attacking Rawls. We'll get to that. And then before that, the part that, we, that you hopefully read for today, him going over a number of objections to patterned or end state theories. He says, whenever, you know, like, let's think about these end state theories, the alternative of this theory. And he says, they run into all sorts of, all manner of problems. So we have about an hour left, so I'm going to talk about all these problems that he thinks the other theory runs into. Um, there's a section in the book that you've read, hopefully, that's called How Liberty Upsets Patterns. It's a very famous section. There was a couple of uh, arguments packed in there, so I want to, at least two, for, at least two I want to discuss. One is about where social justice is supposed to come from. Those are things social justice is a kind of a mysterious idea. It arises out of the Will Chamberlain example. Does anyone remember the Will Chamberlain example? You want to try and summarize it quickly? Um, yeah, go on, Tyler. Uh, wants to uh, charge like 25 cents in addition to the tickets for the game he's playing at, so he's making like an additional however many dollars per game. Yeah, so Will, just, Will Chamberlain, the famous NBA player, right? Um, yeah, he made 100 points. I think he even aver I think he averaged 50 one season. Just like a couple of weeks back, Steph Curry hit 51, and everyone went crazy. He <laughs> averaged 50. Right? Like, couldn't hit a free throw to hit it to uh, save his life. He Except in the game where he scored 100. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was 28 for 32. Really? Yep. Your brain is messed up, there. <laughs> 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 28 to 32. <laughs> we, yeah, well, I hope you didn't talk to her about Will Chamberlain's free throw. <laughs> um, he, he allegedly dunked once from the three, as his free throws. He, could, he was so athletic he could dunk it from standstill. So, from, so, and I think you're not allowed to anymore because of him. But. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's a real rule that they instated because nobody before him could do it and then it was like, well, that's kind of cheating. <laughs> so you now have to stand, you can't, like you can't hit a jumper from the three, three, like you can't leave your feet anymore. Because, 
he would lay, up, lay it up too in the beginning and then he would dunk it after a while. And anyway. <laughs> um, so, Wilt, yeah, Wilt has a, like, Wilt has a contract, right, to play in the NBA. And Nozick says, well, let's imagine it's not the NBA that we know, like today's NBA, but it's an NBA in which um, it's a, like a pure socialist ideal NBA, right? Everyone makes the same amount of money. So everyone gets the same income. Let's say it's a, whatever, right, $10,000 a year, $50,000 a year, whatever it might be. But Wilt says, Wilt is negotiating with the employers. He says, yeah, I like playing basketball, but I like money also. So I have the following deal. I get the same salary as everyone, but then every game I play, there will be a little jar, and people will put 25 cents of their admission ticket into the jar that has Wilt's name on it. Deal, deal, right? Um, everyone loves it, because everyone loves seeing Wilt, and the extra 25 cents is well worth it. They're still getting a bargain, they think. It's a normal ticket of admission, plus 25 cents just to get Wilt in the game. Much better, right? The difference between a normal NBA game and an, and an NBA game with Will Chamberlain is much bigger than 25 cents difference. So you like that. Right? Um, say 100,000 people uh, see him play, right? And then you get 25. Uh, was it? Or, no. And you get two and a half thousand dollars more. A million more people, I think in, K, in Nozick's example, he says a million people watch it, he gets 25 grand more at the end of the year. 10 seasons, 250,000, right? This starts becoming a lot of money. What's wrong? <laughs> because all the NBA players are making the same salary as Will. All the people coming to watch making the same salary. They freely choose everyone to drop, drop a quarter into Will's pocket every time. And now we have, we started with a very equal distribution. Everyone had the same. Now we have, everyone has the same, except Wilt, who has, 10 years later, $250,000 more than they do. Right? No more equality. If you're in favor of these sort of patterned end state theories, right? If you're an egalitarian, you like equality, you have to say, oh no, <laughs> injustice. But no success, well, where, where, when? <laughs> when did it happen? Where did the injustice come from? So this is why, like, where does social justice come from? Like, Rawls wants to talk about social justice, foreshadowing Rawls. Right? So, so where did that come from? Imagine your favorite distribution. It could be equality. It could be maximum difference principle. It could be whatever, right? The Will Chamberlain example shows you that you can very easily go from your favorite distribution to a very, very non-favorite distribution right? in ways that seem completely innocent. Now he says, of course, the historical entitlement theory can, fit, can tell you exactly what happened. Nothing bad happened. Right? It's just people who were the original owners, a just distribution, using legitimate means, donating 25 cents, to get to another distribution, which therefore is just as well. Right? It has to be. Because we have just beginnings, just tra transition, just plus just must equal just. Right? Like there's no, no injustices introduced at any point, and so there cannot be any injustice at the end. And so he says, well, this is a real big problem for you if you have a, if you have a non-historical theory. Anyone have, does anyone have an idea? Where to, what, what would you say back? Like, do you find this convincing? Or? So what? Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hope someone puts uh, puts some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, but like, of course, think about what this Will Chamberlain example is just one. It's one example to show a broader principle, right? If you think that, then. What Will is doing with the spectators is engaging in just a normal market transaction. Right? And if you think that a normal transaction, market transaction doesn't introduce any injustice, well, then when we let free markets roam free, and all sorts of, like not just Will will make a lot of money, but Will plus a whole bunch of other NBA players, plus a lot of other entertainers, plus um, people on Wall Street, plus Warren Buffett, and all these other, and, you may, and then there's me, you know, the crappy sort of philosophy teacher who might, like in the free market, might not be able to get 
to get much of a job at all. And so, you know, they have a lot. I don't have that much. Where's the injustice? Right? Right. That's, the, that's the challenge, right? Like he wants to say, if you cannot point in this example where the injustice is, then it becomes really hard to say in the, in the real world where inequality creates un injustice too. At least if the inequality is, to, like if the inequality is the result of theft or fraud, and so, right? we go back to the historical entitlement theory. These are violations, and we have to rectify them. That's a problem. But if it's just, I invested my money, not so wisely, and now I'm living on the streets, no injustice there. I'll come back to you. Right. I can. It'll probably be one of those jars that people on the street corner hold, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, God bless has written on it or something. And so Wilts might end up with $250,000 on it. Mine might end up with a couple of quarters. Right? But, you know, no success. Then such is life. Try and find something that you're more productive at, that people are willing to pay for. Or if you can't, then hope that people will help you out. And, so, and he says people will, because people are quite nice. And, you know, do. But you know, justice has nothing to do with the situation. Right? Very different from Rawls, right? If uh, people get, end up being really poor in that society, then the distribution isn't according to the difference principle, because they could be much better off under his. And Rawls said, no, no, there is an injustice. But it's a challenge, right? He says, well, OK, well, where did it start? Like, where did, like, where did we come? Start with your favorite, like all equal, right? It'll turn into unequal. No. Okay. I don't know if this has anything to do with anything. <laughs> <laughs> with anything? I hope it has to do with something. Oh, oh. No, it's a, it's a very good, no, it's a great point. It's sort of like a, a consent theory of, of distributive justice. Right? I mean, so I remember if it was Locke or Hume or Kant, whoever said it, they said anything that wasn't consent was not just right. So it seems like if this was consent, since people gave their consent, then it must be just, even if it's not. Yeah, so Locke's theory was that you're bound by whatever authority you consent to. And you're not bound by authority that you don't consent to. So the idea is consent is like is a just maker, right? Like it makes things, like it, it binds you to a certain outcome. And so this is exactly the same idea, right? So Nozick sees himself as a, Lock, as a Lockean, as a follower of Locke. And so he thinks, well, you know, generally speaking, that's true that consent is, is this just preserving or just making feature. And so, well, we have Wilt who has his stuff by assumption, right? Because give whatever your, your favorite distribution, right? So at, does he own it now, right? <laughs> like, so everyone has equal. Do we own our stuff now? Like, yes? Okay, says Nozick, right? Okay, now we have consent. We add consent to the story. So no, Wilt and the spectators, both of whom by, by assumption own their stuff, they consent to the, to the exchange. Your favorite distribution is messed up, but... What are you going to do? You're going to have to either deny um, that consent is a just-making thing, which is, seems kind of patronizing, <laughs> or you have to start undoing the, like, constantly take money away from people who seem to be the rightful holders of the money. And so, that's, so you have to accept it. Think, so. Wasn't Nozick's thing saying that if you're never going to be able to stick to one Right. Yes. He thinks that yeah, and he thinks that's really important, right? So 
that's supposed to be, the lesson he thinks is that it's hopeless to insist on a particular form or pattern of distributions. Because when you start dealing with adults <laughs> who can make their own free choices by consent, they're going to mess it up. Not intentionally, but just by, you know, by buying a house and then buying it in the right neighborhood or in the wrong neighborhood or uh, by buying a house and improving it and then others don't. So they, they want to go to Jamaica on holiday and I, you know, I repaint the outside of the house. So that's going to make a difference in, the, in they're spending money, I'm investing it, right? So, zip, so maybe, maybe you can debate what's the smart choice, but there is a difference in, in our wealth. And so, yeah, he thinks if you're going to, he's really trying to put, put pre so there's two versions of the argument. One is this sort of challenge, like where, like if you think that this, the outcome, because it's unequal, is unjust, you have to tell me where, it, where the injustice comes from. Yeah, that's one version. The second version is, the one that you're pointing to, he thinks, well, ultimately, if we're going to treat people as free, the consequence of that is you have to get rid of this emphasis on distributions. Because whenever you want to do the insist on the distribution, you're going to have to constantly undo or undercut people's free choices. And he thinks that's kind of, it's just unacceptable. It's kind of patronizing and it's coercive and you have a right not to do that. You know, he has this, he's got a knack for phrases. He has this, uh, um, I think I have it on the next on a future slide, but it's um, he says you know in a socialist society you have to prohibit consenting acts between capital so capitalist acts between consenting adults, which is a but you see what he's saying right like oh you think like uh, you think that people who are adults if there's no other, no one else is harmed they should be able to engage in sexual acts if it's between consenting adults yes well here are capitalist acts right like, tell me what the difference is and so he thinks. No difference, and so you allow the one, you allow the other. So, um, yeah, Nick. Do we say, um, so do you say there's, that um, Asians could be at fault for allowing them to initiate a contract that puts them in the village to our house? What was the last bit? The agents would be at fault for? Uh, like allowing him to put his little jar out to collect that money. So, who would be at, who would be at fault? The agent, you mean like the... Well, uh, they, they gave the example of like a... It would be like the NBA, I guess. Allowing them to have a contract that lets them put out a little jar to cut their school. Good. Yeah. Where, and that, where's the fault? Like what's the... For... Because that would, that would be like an inequality. Unless they let every single other person put... put right. Their out to collect money. So they just have a rule that nobody can put out. Yeah, right. So you could have... A, you could have a, like a collective bargaining agreement in which you say no jar is allowed, right? Yeah, or, or and then the it would jar be... is like equally distributed. Right, or, yeah, or whatever gets put into Will's jar gets redistributed across all players or maybe in accordance to the salary cap or something, right? Like whatever, right? Like a percentage of the... Um, yeah, that's fine, right? But you could also have... You could have uh, imagine an agreement where before the season, the agreement is up for grabs. Will says, I'm not going to play if they have to get there. That's an alternative version. Right. So it's perfectly possible. We can perfectly well imagine that everyone would set, agree, including Will, that no one would, would, would be allowed a jar, or that everyone gets a cut from his jar, or whatever. Right? Fine, he says, if they consent to that, we go, go that way. But here's another version, right? Yeah. Everyone consents to Will having his jar. Now where's the problem? He thinks, actually, by the way, he thinks this tells favorably for the entitlement theory, right? Because mm -hmm. look at what we're doing. We're tracing through the history of how the jars came to be the way they are. If the jar goes distributed to everybody else, well, why would that be the right thing to do? Well, because everybody yesterday agreed to it, right? Um, okay, well, now everybody agreed to Will's jar. Well, the same story. Right. So here's the basic outline, right? Um, you've seen this, right? So he thinks... You start just by your favorite D1, distribu distribution one, which is just by assumption, because we just, he's going to grant you, his opponent, whatever you want, full equality. Okay, go. Then right? he says, well, then we have certain things that are just transfers, just in this case, jars and pennies or quarters dropped into them. Right? And he says, well, we just assume that that's, that's okay. Right? Anyone object? No, no. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, 
And then the question is, you know, why, why is, why is this not just? And he thinks, well, if it's not, then you have to tell me, where's the injustice? But look, we only have two elements so far, and they're both, by assumption, just, so can't really have any injustice introduced. Um, all right, here's the argument. Um, so if the first distribution is just, then this just seems to be the upshot of the, of the thing being just, and nobody else has a claim on anyone else's stuff, right? right? So I said earlier, I said, Okay, imagine your favorite distribution. Everyone has the same amount. Okay, do we own it now? Right? <laughs> is it now wrong for me to take some of yours? Yes. Right? Is it wrong for you to take some of mine? Yes. Right? So no one has a claim on anyone else's holdings. Right? Everyone has their stuff? Yes. Okay. So he thinks that's what, that's what it is for a distribution to be just, is that people now legitimately own what they actually hold. If the distribution of resources in our world is just, then I really own my house. People have to stay out of it unless they get my permission. So, okay, well then by hypothesis, D1 is just. That's just a, we're just stipulating that. So therefore, before the transfer, in front, uh, before the transfer here in D1, no one has a claim on anyone else's holdings, right? It just follows. All right. So the transfer from D1 to D2 is just by assumption, because we're just saying, we're imagining there's no th thievery going on. Wilt isn't duping anyone. He isn't holding guns to anyone's heads. He's just saying, if you'd like to come see me play, put a quarter in. And people are saying, actually, I like that. And they put a quarter in. Right? That's the whole story. Seems perfectly just. We're stipulating that in our thought experiment. And so if the transfer is just, here comes the claim, right? Then no one has a claim against the holdings that are being transferred. That is just what it means for transfer to be just, right? You own your quarter. I don't have a claim against you giving it to Wilt because it's not, none of my business. Right? Wilt doesn't have a claim. Against, like, he can't force you to transfer the quarter to him. He can ask you. Right? But ultimately, if the transfer is just, then nobody is being wronged by this. Right? It's not that somebody else says, what well, was my quarter? No, it wasn't. Right? All right, well, then, right, then the claim is here. Well, then after the transfer in D2, once we're here, no one can have a claim on anyone else's holdings. That's just D2 is just. That's the same idea. Right. And if nobody has a claim against anyone else's holdings, then redistribution would be wrong, right? Because it would be taking from people what they rightfully own. And so there goes the, there goes the argument. Right. That's the kind, that's, I think, as precise as I can make the Will Chamberlain intuition. Does anyone have any questions about this? No? All right. Now, the key claim is the fifth one, right? This is the legitimate tran is that transfers are justice preserving. That's his, that's his idea. It's the consent idea, right? That con con consent is this justice confer conferring or preserving thing. Um, is that true, right? Does it mean that whenever you go from one distribution to another by means of consensual transfer, that the consensual transfer not just transfers the holdings, but also transfers the justice from one to the other? That's the key claim here. The rest are all stipulating. Um, so here's a question. How much you claim, how much you test this? Um, don't, like, it won't do to just look, point to D2 and say, oh, there's inequality there, right? Because that's the exact thing that we're wondering about. Like, whether that's just or unjust. So, can you, there's a question, I'm asking you this. Like, how might you test the idea whether transfers or consensual transfers really are justice preserving? Like, whether nothing wrong can be introduced by a consensual transfer? Think about how you might, let's say you want to challenge this. You say, well, actually, D1 is just, the transfer is just, but D2 would be unjust.
Good, right. So we might look for a case where we move from a place that looks innocent by means that, looks, that look innocent one by one, but the aggregate result seems not so innocent. Yeah, that would be like finding a counterexample, right? Do you have an example you can give? Yes, I, I, was, I was thinking of, um, there was a court case a long time ago where, I, I forget the name of the particular court case, maybe, maybe Ian can help me out because we have constitutional law together, but where farmers were trying to, were, were trying to keep a certain amount of wheat for their cattle, and even though there were regulations on the wheat, and then a farmer tried to sue, and it made all the way to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court ended up saying, well, no, there are particular controls because coming right out of the Great Depression, they didn't want to have, it wasn't so much about the farmer trying to keep some of the wheat to feed for his cattle, even though they said this is the amount of wheat that we want you to grow. It's more like, what if multiple farmers want to act this way, then you would end up with a curve, you would end up with higher prices on the wheat. Right. Yeah, the case, I don't know the name either, but the case you're talking about is the, it's usually sort of seen as the death of the Commerce Clause in the Constitution, right? Yes. yes. So, yeah, the, the, lit, as you, if you read the Commerce Clause, it says the federal government has the authority to regulate interstate commerce. Um, and this was a key, sta key case where it turned out that they could regulate even farmers storing wheat on their own premises, which is about as... And that's about as far away from interstate commerce as you can get. And then the argument was, well, by not putting it on the market, they're affecting the price, and that's interstate commerce. Most people think, well, this is sort of the re like, it's a kind of an absurd view where you think, well, now not engaging in commerce counts as commerce, right? So, anyway, so um, for better or worse, but that's the, that's the view, yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, well, let's think about that. So the farmers say, uh, oh, I'm not selling my, uh, selling my, my wheat, keeping it for my cows. So where's the injustice? Oh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that the farmer wasn't selling the wheat or keeping it for his cows. He was growing more than, more than the federal government said that you should grow because they were trying to put, it seems the city is, but they're trying to put controls on the wheat, <laughs> controls on the wheat so that they could get out of the, get out of the slump that they just came out of, they just came out of Great Depression, so they wanted a certain amount of wheat to introduce into the marketplace, and they didn't want growing too much wheat Right. Yeah, so for this to be a good, I mean, I think you're looking in the right direction. For it to be a power, something like Nozick, you know, is going to say, right? The federal government has no business telling these farmers how much wind to grow, right? right. These are price controls. That's the reason why they have rationing policies that have price controls, and now these farmers are messing with the prices. Well, as they should, right? That's their right, he thinks. So he's not going to feel the pressure. But you're doing the right thing. You're looking for, like, can we find a counterexample? I was, right? just, I was just trying to think of something. Right. No, no. It's a, I'm saying you're looking, you're looking in the right